Okay, so listen, thanks very much everybody for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about ESB Network's Dingle project tonight. And I suppose in simple terms, the Dingle project is really about helping ESB Networks understand the impact on the electricity network arising from changes to the way people across society will consume and manage their electricity usage. And the learnings from Dingle will lead into and inform other programs of work, business plans, and ultimately the design of the electricity network to support a low carbon society. So that's really what the project is about. Okay, just one sec. Okay, so I, I suppose we have a small team um, on the project at the moment, and um, I think one or two of my colleagues might be might be listening in at the moment, but we have Claire McGelligat, who leads a lot of our engagement work across the peninsula, a key part of the project, and Kieran Geeney, who's been leading the delivery of all our technologies and ICT systems that are needed to actually support what we're doing. So, um, okay. So in my present today, presentation today, I'll give a bit of information about the project as a whole. And if you've been on previous uh, presentations that we've done, I'll give you a refresh of what the objectives of the project are about and the technologies in place. Um, and I'll share some of the progress on the, on the trials to date. So um, obviously I'm speaking to the initiated here. You all know where Dingle is. Um, and I'm sure you've, you've all visited that part of the country. Um, and I suppose we chose Dingle for a number of reasons. Um, it's exposure to the North Atlantic winds and storms. I suppose that means if the technologies that we deploy in Dingle can survive, they're likely to survive anywhere else on our network. But another reason we chose Dingle was at the time we were kicking off our project, there were a number of un other initiatives starting on the, on the peninsula, which were very complementary to what we were actually trying to do. And we knew that by using Dingle, we'd have essentially a willing cohort of people that were willing, that would be able and willing to work with us. So even before the government published its climate action plan in 2019, ESB Networks had designed the Dingle project to understand the impact of electric vehicles, heat pumps, solar PV, and residential settings on our network. Now, obviously the climate action plan with its targets of achieving 1 million electric vehicles on Ireland ro Ireland's roads and about 600,000 premises equipped with electrical heating by 2030 has really reinforced the objectives of the project. And I suppose the project was set up with four objectives. Uh, flexibility, which is really all around whether it's possible to control technologies behind the meter in people's homes, such as the EV chargers, heat pumps, and so on. Control it in a way so as to minimize their impact on the electricity network and at times provide flexibility to uh, ESP networks as the distribution system operator, such that reinforcement investments um, that we might have planned might be deferred or eliminated altogether. In the whole area of peer-to-peer, -peer, what we wanted to do was trial one form of community-based peer-to-peer energy, um, which in a way so as to understand its impact on the electricity network and determine ultimately the types of systems and processes that might be, might be needed to actually make that happen. And I suppose with more and more people going to become dependent on electricity um, to power their homes and or to power their cars and heat their homes, we wanted to trial a number of different technologies so as to make the network more reliable for all our customers and ultimately by eliminating certain types of faults that might occur or by finding faults faster in the instance in the situation where they do happen. And the whole area of the active energy citizen is something really interesting. And really what we wanted to do on our, on our project was understand the blockers and the enablers for people to transition from essentially passive consumers of electricity to active energy citizens. Oops, sorry, I'm gone too far there. Um, and we spent roughly the last two and a half years engaging the community, uh, encouraging participation in our trials, procuring technologies and devices, and installing and testing them at trial participants' homes. Now, to date, we've installed 25 solar PV systems on people's houses. Five air source heat pumps have been installed. We've carried out deep retrofits of two residential properties and one restaurant bar area uh, premises on, on the peninsula. We've installed five residential batteries. We leased 17 electric vehicles for a year, and we provided 15 of these with smart electric vehicle chargers to 15 of our trial participants, with the other two vehicles being made available to citizens uh, on a managed basis, and hopefully even uh, 
in even in Cork, maybe people from the, the Kerry region have driven that far and you'll have seen the branding on our EVs. But we've also installed home energy monitoring equipment in all of our trial sites, the 35 trial sites that we have on the peninsula. And just last week, uh, we successfully connected Ireland's first residential uh, vehicle to grid um, electric vehicle chargers in Ireland. Um, basically, we swapped out um, for five of our participants the smart EV chargers that we had and we gave them um, the VTG units. So the behind the meter test bed as we've, uh, that, we were, that we've been talking about for the last year and a bit, it's now fully established. Now we selected five ambassadors to work with us on this project. Um, and what we're actually trying to get them to do is really tell the story about their life um, with all the technology that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. So they have the full suite of technology, as, as you can see in the diagram here, from um, the interval meter to the smart EV charger, the EV for a year, the air source heat pump, the battery, solar PV on the roof, and the home energy monitoring technology. But we've also implemented technology to allow us to send control signals to each device in the home. Um, and we've equipped each premises with a gateway which can communicate with our back end optimization platform. And I'll talk a little bit about that later to operate the technologies both in the best economic interest of the trial participants, um, but also in a way so as that we can test the various flexibility scenarios that we wanted to, to run through. And most recently, we've rolled out a mobile app for all trial participants, which provides them with next to real time inform information on their energy footprint and what's happening in their premises, enabling them to make changes to their energy behavior if they so wish. And, and while we might have installed lots of different technologies, the scale of it is still quite small. And I suppose when you add it all up, what we have is at max about 150 kilowatts of controllable load and about 100 kilowatts of injection onto the network possible from what we've actually installed. So it's still relatively small in the bigger scheme of things, but um, certainly still lots of room for us to actually uh, carry out some interesting tests and trials. Now we talked briefly about peer-to-peer -peer being one of our um, project objectives. And our intention here was um, for our peer-to-peer -peer trial was to create a number of small communities, our small energy communities defined in line with uh, the underlying electricity network. So for example, all customers connected to a specific feed or our transformer on the network. And our intention was to get each individual customer to optimize as much as possible their own energy usage. And for any spill, um, to be then utilized within the local community by other trial participants in, in that area. And ultimately what we wanted to do was understand the potential impact on any power flows um, and the value of that, that a peer-to-peer -peer energy initiative might offer to the local network operator. So um, as well as understanding the complexity of establishing any such systems and infrastructure. I suppose one of the key things we needed was an electricity supplier to work with us on this, but due to a combination of different factors, it wasn't possible at the time we were doing this um, to actually get somebody to work with us on this project. So we actually ended up having to park that um, aspect of our trial. Now, there is a report on the ESB Networks website, which we published last December, on the learnings and the efforts that we went to to try and kickstart our peer-to-peer -peer initiative. So anybody who's interested could look there and give it a good read. And the next few slides that I have here um, are focusing on the work that's been happening to actually improve the reliability of the network for all of our customers in Tingle. And I suppose as the take up of electric vehicles and electrified heating increases over the, the coming years, so too will the dependence on the electricity network by all of our customers. Um, they needed to heat their homes and, and power their cars. So in parallel with, with ESB networks, um, in parallel with that, ESB networks is incentivized to enhance the reliability of our network so as to minimize regulatory penalties associated with supply interruptions uh, for all of our customers. So network reliability is a key part of what we try to improve on a day-to-day -day basis with cross ESB networks. And part of the work of the project involved upgrading, upgrading existing devices on the, on the medium voltage network um, and connecting them back to our SCADA systems, establishing remote control to enable various operational tasks to be carried out faster and thereby enhancing the overall service to all customers on the peninsula. So just my fantastic graphics here, uh, the tick green line on the graphic represents the 38 kV line feeding the peninsula from Tralee. And the stars represent the, the two 38 kV stations at each and Dingle. And the network in red is the 20 kV network and blue is the 10 kV network. So, um, I suppose in the instance that uh, where the tree line to fail, the peninsula can be fed from the Milltown Killarney uh, direction. Now, as part of our project, we work with the people out of the tree area to upgrade a lot of the technologies and 
that were on the peninsula, in particular the recloser devices that were on the the, the 20 kV network. And I suppose um, these are really important and helpful to automate the switching and backfeeding in times when maintenance work has been carried out on the 38 kV stations or in the circuit in between the two the two stations as I had shown. Um, now, if you look at it at the the yellow circles as such on the 20 kV network there. We've actually upgraded five of the six reclosers on the 20 kV network and they're now fully controllable from the National Distribution Control Centre. Um, in parallel with that, the Tralee team also upgraded the voltage regulators on the 20 kV circuit. Um, the, the two of them that are on the 10 kV circuit will be upgraded as part of a larger upgrade of the overall 10 kV network that's going to happen in 2022. And I suppose these, the, the, all the upgrades that have been done and connecting these devices back to our, our distribution control center have, you know, they've significantly reduced the time that's required now for any backfeeding or restoration operations that might be needed on the peninsula. They've eliminated many hundreds of kilometers of driving that our network technicians would have had to do and all of the associated vehicle emissions. And they freed up a number of our technicians to focus on other operational duties, all the while enhancing the, the service that we're offering to all customers on the peninsula. So the work that we've done, even with the existing assets on the peninsula, it's, it's leading to a, a better overall supply uh, and service to all our customers. But what we also want to do is test some new technologies on the peninsula to determine what, whether they might enhance the overall reliability of the network. So we've installed a number of fault passage indicators on some of the circuits on the peninsula. Now, when a fault occurs and the fault current passes through the FPI, essentially keeps a record of this. And what we're doing in our project is investigating whether data analysis of this fault passage data will help us better identify where faults have occurred and enable reductions in the times required to resolve those faults. So if we can analyze the data, pinpoint better where the faults have occurred, send that information to our technicians, get the repair crews to the spots uh, clo closer to where the fault might have occurred, it'll, it'll greatly speed up um, the resolution of the faults. Now we've actually rolled out two different um, manufacturers products, products from Horseman's and Bowden's, and we're trying to see which device is better suited uh, to different points on the network. For example, um, is there sufficient load on the circuits that are powered, um, that power the Horseman devices are are the Bowden's battery power devices more appropriate in certain locations? And in, in you can see two of them are solar powered um, devices as well. So in some instances, is the solar powered solution a better way of powering the device and keeping it keeping it stable rather than going into sleep mode if, if nothing is really happening on the peninsula? So like fault passage indicators are new in the ESP networks. We have had a number of trials and there's other trials ongoing in other parts of the countries, but the smart FPIs that we're trialing in Dingle are allowing us to see whether the, the data from these devices can be used to better pinpoint where the faults record on the network, enabling us to send repair crews to more specific location, whereas traditionally they would have been required to patrol a long section of line in order to find a fault. So there's lots of safety value as well, like if somebody had to patrol five or ten kilometres a line in the dark, some of it cross fields and things like that, you know, the safety risks that we're eliminating by potentially leveraging the smart FPIs and the data associated with that. Now, in the previous slide, I showed locations of recloser devices on the three phase 20 kV circuits on the peninsula, which are connected back to SCADA. Now, trials of recloser devices on single phase circuits have previously taken place elsewhere on our, uh, on our networks in the country, and they showed that well over 90% of the faults. Um, are often transient in nature caused by things like board strikes or branches tipping against the lines. And I suppose what the reclosers do is they instantly check whether the faults have been resolved and essentially maintain power for downstream customers. And ultimately, they pro that then provides significant service to ESP networks in terms of reduced penalties for outages and customers been out over many minutes or many hours of time, uh, as well as kind of eliminating the need for various maintenance callouts by by our crews. So. Our trials of um, single phase reclosers to date have been dumb elsewhere in the country, essentially with no visibility on our SCADA system or remote control enabled of those devices. So to view the history of what happened, you would have needed to kind of visit the site and download data onto a laptop and all of this. And ultimately where a permanent fault occurred um, and the devices entered into what we call lockout mode, you still needed to send a technician to the, to the site and operate the device either with a laptop or operating rods. Now, what we did as part of the Dingle project is we successfully integrated the first single phase 
laser closers with our back end SCADA system. So there's lots of technical complexity in doing that, but we achieved it. So we've actually enabled the data to be analyzed that, that comes out of these devices and uh, to facilitate, facilitate remote control where necessary. So all, all very helpful to improving the overall efficiency of the network. I suppose what this slide is doing now is showing pictures of two of the models of the fault passage indicators that we're trialing in Dingle. So the Horseman device uh, is installed on the overhead lines themselves and the Bowden's device is installed on the pole. And basically we're pulling back data from both of these devices into a kind of a single cloud platform where we, can, where we can compare the results and determine which model device is best suited for ESB networks or for different parts of our network. I suppose this slide here now is just a few photos of the installation of the single phase reclosers um, at two of the locations on, on the network. And I suppose one the key thing about this is for one of those single phase reclosers, um, there are potentially 85 customers downstream of it who would benefit if there was a transient fault uh, on the network. Um, and for the other one, there's 76 customers downstream. So while the two reclosers have been installed and commissioned back to our SCADA system, they're not fully operational yet because we're going through the final phases of uh, training of some of our, our network technicians and control room operators on, on how they do operate. But we're expecting that by the end of this month, um, they'll, they'll be fully running and fully operational. So was, and I suppose in addition to the work that we've been doing on the, the medium voltage network and to help us understand the impact of on our low voltage network of the renewable and clean energy enabling technologies that we've installed in our trial participants homes. So we needed to install other devices and monitoring units on our um, low voltage network so we could understand that. So we've installed a technology in our ground mounted substations and at our pole mounted uh, transformers to provide data for analysis and to really understand what's happening on the network. So across the network as a whole, there's 30 locations where we've installed these low voltage monitors. And one of my later slides um, shows data from the monitor. You can see some of the things that you can actually find out. Now, um, now, I suppose at the same stage as we're carrying out all of our technical trials, we're also working with the local community, our Dingle ambassadors and other trial participants to understand the enablers and blockers to electricity consumers transitioning into low carbon active energy citizens. So it's a really kind of interesting thing and something new for ESB networks to be to be involved in. And we've run many different initiatives to engage all demographics across the peninsula on the work of the project. And we've been working with local institutions and other groups on the peninsula to help empower individuals and the community as a whole to progress gradually along the low carbon energy transition journey. And we've been working with the social research team from um, Marai and UCC, and they're bringing the skills with them to help evaluate the effectiveness of the different initiatives that have been undertaken. Not just things that we've kicked off, but things that elsewhere have been happening across the peninsula. And all of that, that analysis and their research is, is helping us all to better understand the blockers and enablers of low carbon transformation and how best active energy citizen behaviours can be diffused across communities. Now, Marai have already uh, published a number of different reports or as they call them, learning briefs in relation to the, that whole wider low carbon transformation. And between this and the end of the year, there'll be further reports and learning briefs published by them. So, you know, have a look at the Mario website and see what's there. Um, and I suppose what we mean by an active energy citizen is somebody who makes decisions and takes actions around their energy usage so, have, so as to have a positive impact on the energy system. Now, from ESB network selfish perspective, what we're interested in is the potential to positively impact on the local electricity network. So this might mean uh, a consumer reducing their energy consumption by turning down their heating, their electric heating, charging their EV at off peak times, or aligning their energy usage in the home to when the sun is shining um, and the solar panels are producing. Or it might just involve sharing their experience when somebody else wants to start on their own energy transformation journey. And that's a really powerful part of this. It's about communities kind of learning from other people's and their peers across the community. So um, while on the Dingle project, we've probably created some active energy citizens that might reflect the end point of the transition. We've given them all the technologies that we think they'll, they'll probably ever uh, choose to invest in. Others may gradually transition to that point or to points along that journey. So, as I mentioned, we've been engaging at all levels of the community to get people thinking and talking about the energy transition. So we run events in primary schools and secondary schools. We've had a presence at local community festivals, GAA competitions, the works to drum up interest in the Dingle project. But we're also an active member on the wider Dingle 2030 or Kirk Guina 2030 initiative, which is looking at low carbon transformation across all areas. Um, 
in, in the wider, wider peninsula. So transport, industry, agriculture and tourism. And being involved there, we're seeing lots of new initiatives kickstart and maybe some of them wouldn't have kickstarted without the ESB Networks project in place, or certainly they would have been slower to kickstart. So we're delighted that other initiatives have started in parallel or maybe as a follow on to some of the work that we've been doing. Now, one of the key things that we're actually trying to do is to get the Dingle ambassadors and our trial participants to tell their own stories. So unfortunately, COVID actually forced us to change the way we were doing business. Originally, we'd intended to do lots of information sessions on the peninsula, but COVID came along and we had to, to rethink what we were doing. So, you know, in a way, it actually worked for us to get our message to a wider audience. So we've taken part in a number of podcasts on, on Radio Kerry uh, to discuss various topics such as solar PV, electric vehicles, heat pumps, and all the work that we're doing to try and make the network more reliable. Now, these podcasts have included somebody from our own team, uh, an industry expert, and one of the people participating on the trials. And like local radio gives a great reach across the community. And these podcasts, we think, have been a great way to get an unbiased message out there. So. We're not, we're ESP Network, so we're not trying to sell any of this sort of stuff. We just want to, to help people understand what transformation is all about. Now, the five Dingle ambassadors have also been telling their own story and various videos are available on YouTube or Dingle 20, the Dingle 2030 website. It's great to actually hear them talk and warts and all about their experience. But I suppose if you roll the clock forward, it'll be interesting to see in the next 12 or 24 months or so, what the demonstrable initiatives in Dingle that we've been helping with, um, together with the local capability that has been established over the last couple of years, what that has done to the take up of clean energy technologies and the wider diffusion of sustainable behaviours across the peninsula. So um, maybe a lot of the learnings in the active energy citizen space won't be identified by the time we're moving off our project at the end of this year, early next year. It could be two or three years before all this, all those lessons actually become apparent. And I suppose what we're trying to do now, and we're working with all of the members of the Dingle 2030 um, initiative in this, is trying to map out from the wider experiences in Dingle, what mechanisms might work to engage and encourage more individuals to start on their own low carbon energy transformation journey. So this slide could be a full webinar in its own right, where we discuss everything that has been tried and tested in Dingle and share the insights emerging from it. Now, we've been looking into what might be required to get over the three big challenges of access to trusted information, really, really important, access to finance, and ultimately the capability to implement the necessary technologies and changes to behaviours that will help people transition into active energy citizens. And where there'll always be the innovators and adopters across society who will be willing and potentially can afford to be able to try out new technologies in order to achieve the climate action plan targets, you know, um, of a million EVs and 600,000 houses equipped with electrified heating. So in order to achieve those sort of targets with it by the 2030 timeframe, and who knows what the, the, the next version of the Climate Action Plan is going to say, but you know, as a society, we need to start moving faster across, if you look at that innovation adoption life cycle, from where we are at the moment, which might be towards the end of the, the early adopter cycle, we need to get to the end of that early majority or start of the late majority phase, where there's lots and lots of people starting to make that transformation. So there's, there's quite a lot of work to be done. Um, the next couple of slides now for the people that, that are listening in that are IT interested, um, we'll share a little bit of information on, on the ICT systems and infrastructure that we've put in place to support and enable uh, the flexibility trials in our project. So again, in summary, just to, to rehash uh, this, so what technologies have we deployed? Well, we've the 25 solar panels installed, uh, three properties underwent a deep retrofit, and in total we've kitted out five properties with Mitsubishi air source heat pumps, five properties got a hybrid energy storage system, 15 people got an EV for 12 months and had a smart charger installed, and five of these have actually received their V2G charger as of last week. Um, every participant household has got an energy monitoring system that's providing real-time and historical energy information through a web interface and a mobile app, so they're, they're much more informed now. And the other two EVs are being managed uh, across the peninsula to give other people um, the whole experience of electric, electric motoring. So um, I'll talk now a little bit about the technology platform that enables and ties everything together. So we've been collaborating with a German French energy IoT company, a company called Greencom Networks, to establish the back end optimization system that will control the operation of the heat pumps, the batteries, the EV chargers and everything, and which will pull back information from the home energy monitoring devices. So the gateway device in the home is the link between 
the information in the cloud and all the technologies behind the meter. So these guys, the, the Green Carbon Networks guys, um, have a series of algorithms within their platform, which ultimately produce a next day schedule of operations for each of the technologies using the latest forecast information and some of the data from each of the properties. Um, the Greencom Networks technology is capable of optimizing the operation of the devices in the home using various data inputs and targets, whether, for example, to achieve the lowest carbon emissions um, based on the operation of all the, the kit or the least cost for the consumer. So what we're doing in ESB Networks, we're feeding the algorithms um, with various pricing or tariff information to influence the operation of the technologies towards different times of the day, thereby minimizing their impact on the network. So I'll talk a little bit about more about that in a minute. So just a quick picture of, you know, all the stuff under the bonnet on the Greencom Networks um, infrastructure. Now, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but really, um, the Greencom Networks platform can interface with many different device types and many different uh, manufacturers' technologies. And the hardware requirements are actually very minimal. And Greencom utilizes um, cloud-based services and technologies like that to deliver their overall suite of tools and applications um, and to provide several forms of energy and heat services. So, you know, they're, they're a very interesting company in terms of what they do. And on the Dingle project, we have three distinct groupings of customers. First, we have 20 solar PV participants. And for these, there's a low cost energy monitoring sensor deployed at their meter point and also at the output point for their solar PV panels. So these measurements are collected by the Greencom Network's gateway in the home and fed into the cloud database. Now from there, it can serve the mobile app so that essentially these customers or trial participants can see their live and historical usage. And it's hoped with this information um, that these solar PV trial participants can make more use of their solar or better use of their solar. So ESB Networks also has a secure connection to the Greencom Networks platform. And you know, we use that for our data collection, analytics and reporting and so on. The next group of customers then are our EV trial participants. And these have all been uh, provided with a smart Wallbox EV charger. Wallbox is a Spanish company and an energy monitoring sensor, again, installed at the meter point. So the information from the charger is coupled with that from the energy sensor. And that allows us to understand what percentage of energy consumption is attributed to the EV and EV charging as, as opposed to the rest of um, consumption across the domestic property. So the Greencom Networks Gateway in this instance has a software driver that can connect to and control the EV charger based on commands and information from the centralized uh, Greencom Network, Networks platform. So it's all this optimization. So it runs an, op an economic optimization that aims to save the customer money by scheduling the EV charging to the cheapest times like uh, on the off-peak uh, night rates. Now also shown in this picture here are um, a number of third-party APIs that can that you know we could use to obtain things like market pricing, which we do, and I'll talk about that in a second, and potentially stuff like forecasted renewables, demand, or carbon intensity. And these metrics ultimately could be pushed into the algorithm to achieve or uh, to drive a different optimization outcome. And the last group of participants on our trial are our five project ambassadors who have received the full suite of technologies, including the EV, the smart EV charger, energy monitoring sensors, Mitsubishi air source heat pump, hybrid battery energy storage system and solar PV. Now, as with the EV trial participants, the Greencom Networks Gateway connects to all of the various installed assets and provides really rich uh, detail on the operation of the energy, uh, of their energy usage or the production of each of their devices in the home. And the gateway in these properties also runs the, op the optimization to determine the best running schedule for the devices, ultimately for the, the, the economic benefit of the customer. So that's what we're actually trying to do. What's, where we, can we give them the best bang for their, for their technologies? So all of the collected data is available to trial participants via the web interface or mobile app. And you know, we'll give you a little bit of an overview of that now. Just have a quick drink for a second. So as I mentioned, the platform enables real-time home energy monitoring for the trial participants with visibility of their live and historical energy usage. And it's available via the web or mobile apps. <clears throat> so the interface has three main elements. 
So first of all, it has a dashboard that provides an overview in the form of small tiles or charts, and it's fully customizable by the trial participants. So they can display what's important to them. For example, the number of units of solar PV produced and that was consumed within the home. And maybe they might use that to give them an indication of how much their solar panels are saving them in terms of energy costs. So the next page on it then provides a live status and it shows the live consumption and production of the technologies within the home. It updates every 60 seconds. And you know, energy, energy, and, and energy, any energy uh, consumption which is not being measured directly is grouped together as general domestic load. And you'll see that have an example of that. And we kind of we have a, a grouped heading, so appliance load it's called, but it's basically anything that's not your heat pump or your EV charger as such. Now the final tab on on the um, on the interface then is a reporting tool which for the more engaged users of the technology, it allows them to plot all of the available data points and maybe download the data for their own usage or analysis themselves. Um, there's also a settings page, which allows the trial participants to change the language of the app that they have um, to Irish if they so wish. And that's, that's really important for kind of where we're actually doing our trials with uh, lots of Gaeltuck speaking areas on the Dingle Peninsula. So this feature, even though it's kind of simple, has been really well appreciated by people on the trial. That that's just a, a few more pictures um, of the web interface. So the next slide, this is really interesting. So this sl slide shows an ambassador home. Um, I suppose if you add up the numbers, we can see that the battery energy storage system uh, will combined with the solar PV and essentially the, the 1,283 watts coming in from the grid. When you add all that up, that serves the, the 2,511 watts of demand for the heat pump and the rest of the household appliance load. And I suppose this updates every every minute or so. So um, maybe it's already changed there as I wasn't really paying too much attention. Um, but it was interesting. We did a live demo of this today at one of our ambassador homes um, and we had a number of visitors down and we actually, we actually turned off uh, some of the devices um, and it was actually great to see see it in live terms that, for example, we turned off um, the heat pump and you could see the usage of the heat pump scale down. And ultimately, instead of being importing off the network, um, we were actually exporting because the sun was shining at the time. You know, and it, it, it kind of our demo today really brought to life um, how, the, how the technology works and what visibility of the technology in the home are in the hands of the ambassador, uh, helping them to understand what's going on, enabling them to make various decisions um, in terms of the energy usage. But of course, we have all the optimization that's going on behind the scenes as well. So it was really good to see us trying to actually control the technologies and essentially fighting against the schedule um, that was in play for the day when we were down there today. So we, we got great learnings out of it anyway. <clears throat> And I suppose the interface as well has a fully responsive design. So it adapts to all screen sizes and, and works very well kind of from a, mo a mobile interface perspective. So that, that's always helpful. So now that we understand a little bit more about the background, the technologies installed and the platform that ties it all together, it kind of brings us nicely to our flexibility trial. So today ESB Networks plans the network for the most heavily lo loaded kind of period of the year. So by by being able to effectively reduce demand at those kind of heavily loaded times when the network is maybe constrained a little bit, that could essentially allow us to unlock headroom or capacity that exists. And that could mean us being able to accommodate the connection of additional demand customers or do further electrification of heat and transport and still satisfy all our, our customer requirements. Um, I suppose the, the optimization algorithms and calculations that we're running on our gateways in the homes you know, if they work effectively, and we, we think they will, that should mean that we have reduced loadings during peak times that could potentially allow traditional network reinforcements to be deferred for a period. Um, so being able to command all the gateways to reduce their controllable demand to a minimum and leverage all the installed energy storage for stuff, the, en the energy storage in the batteries will form part of our tests and services like this might become increasingly important over the coming years should there be significant system events on the network. Now, I suppose the, the Dingle project didn't cover um, how these energy or flexibility services will be procured and what entities will be involved in that process. We're really just looking at the technical feasibility of some of the systems to actually enable that to happen. But the National Network's Local Connections Programme, which was launched last week, they will be considering those aspects of procurement and all of that as part of their various flexibility pilots, pilots as they're advancing them over the coming years. 
So keep an eye on that space. So really what we want to do from a flexibility perspective is see whether we can move power forward or backwards um, throughout, throughout the day um, by sending control signals from our Greencom Networks platform to the devices behind the meter at the trial participants' homes. Now, we wanted to do this in a way that still means the technology technologies meet the basic purpose uh, for the customers. For example, the EV battery is at the correct charge level in the morning, or hot water is, at the, is available when people need it in the home. So our solar PV participants have no controllable technology, so they're not really part of a flexibility test. So instead, for those guys, what we're trying to do is um, we're providing them this rich energy information and we're hoping that they'll be able to use that to, to drive behavior change. Um, and ultimately the intention is they can maximize the benefits um, they get from their solar PV through better alignment of their energy usage with the available PV production when it's happening. So when we started to scope out our flexibility trials, we had three scenarios that we wanted to test. So the first was a, a time-based optimization where the controller would move high energy usage associated, for example, with heat, EV charging or heat pump uh, usage away from peak times and then leverage energy storage where available um, essentially in combination to, to do some load shifting and peak load shaving. So the idea here was to try to mimic where people will start to align their energy usage with new supplier or retailer tariffs that are starting to emerge. And we can understand the impact of this on the network. Now for this type of test, the parameters ultimately will be designed at the start of the test cycle and ultimately wouldn't change. So you'd have EV loading moving to night times and things like that and remaining like that over, over a period of maybe a week or two weeks as, as what we're trying to do within our own tests. The second scenario is really a follow on from that. Um, but we try to use a dynamic tariff in a way to potentially reflect different pricing for every half hour of the day um, that might come into play. There might be time, time use tariffs that might be, I wouldn't even call them radical, but they, they might be a bit of bit of movement in them if there was uh, a potential challenge on the network coming up over the next couple of days or so. Um, and ultimately, what we're trying to do is to get our platform to take day ahead pricing information and produce the optimal operating schedule on that basis so that devices and, and technologies would be moved away from the higher pricing uh, periods. So ultimately, so the consumer would consume energy when cheapest um, and they would leverage their own energy storage where available when uh, the pricing is highest. So that's kind of part of what we're trying to do. And um, I think the next slide I have will probably make that a little bit clearer. Um, I suppose in the UK at the moment, there are dynamic tariffs like that, and it's likely that they'll come into play in Ireland over time. Um, and our final scenario that we wanted to test was um, where we could issue a command instruction to all of the technologies in the home, essentially to respond to an event on the network. So um, controllable demand will be reduced to a minimum, um, and that would be supplemented by energy storage in the, in the home where it was available. Um, and that response will be maintained um, say for 30 minutes or for an hour and ultimately what we want to do is see whether we can get all this stuff to kick off and respond within say 90 seconds of, of the triggered response so uh, some interesting kind of challenges there to actually see whether all the technology is responsive in that manner so um, the energy networks association they had an open networks project which looked to standardize active power services or flexibility product designs and they proposed four different uh, product types sustain secure dynamic and restore so you might have heard of some of these in, in various um, webinars by other parties so our flexibility tests actually align very closely with these and like in simple terms if you look at the sustain one what we're trying to do is we, see can we move energy consumption away from some of the peaks, but kind of have that regular cycle, for example, electric vehicles charging at night time. That's in a very simple kind of uh, scenario. So already we're, we're seeing some electricity suppliers come out with what they're calling a super off peak tariff, maybe between two or five o'clock in the morning where they're very cheap electricity. And, you know, the likelihood is they're trying to encourage people to, to shift some of their load to that period of time, maybe where they can purchase that energy uh, very cheaply from the wholesale market. So what we're actually trying to do in our flexibility test and see, is it possible to, to define a schedule within our optimization, optimization uh, software that will actually move some of those loads to those periods and, and try to mimic what might be the case into the future. For a secure product, um, what we're actually doing is we're looking at Octopus Energy in the UK, they publish um, a day ahead tariff. And what we're actually trying to do is at four o'clock every day, take the day ahead tariff that they publish and feed it into our platform and see 
when we run the our secure uh, flexibility tests, see whether we can get the the technologies to be price responsive to you know what's probably a, a more changing profile. So rather than in, in, in the sustain uh, product where it might be quite blocky, you might just have a day and a night tariff uh, or price. Um, for the secure profile, it be might be a bit more flexible or changing throughout the day. So we want to actually check check that out and see where the technology works on that basis. Again, for our dynamic um, tests, really what we want to do is see if there's a particular event on the network, can we achieve essentially a change in load profile shown by the red line there? Can we switch off load? Can we get uh, storage in the home to inject power in, into onto the local home to actually meet that demand? And see ultimately, can we, can we solve our parts of some serious event that's actually happening on the network for the restore product we're not actually we're not running tests um as uh, the ena guys would have defined them but really what we're trying to do is use our use our project um to figure out how long it would take after say for example there was a blackout on on the network how long it actually takes for some of the technologies in the home to actually um start up again and be where they can actually communicate back to the centralized platform and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see the responsiveness of, of some of the technologies. So quickly, quick update on progress. So all of our technologies have been installed. We're doing a little bit of work refining um, the optimization algorithms, preparing our pricing schedules to feed into them so that we can run some, some more tests over the coming weeks. So on the previous graph there are slide there I had the four products lined out scenarios for uh, one and two are secure and sustained uh, products they're now operational and um, so it'll be interesting to see what the results, results of those are over the coming weeks we've lots of learnings that we're getting getting already um in terms of flexibility in a domestic or residential setting a lot of the findings are around um communications um, th there's been lots of challenges you know cellular network outages on the Dingle Peninsula have affected a lot of our, our LV monitoring uh, devices that we've on the network and um, we've had broadband issues where there might be a local supplier uh, might be providing broadband to five or six of our participants and issues there you might we might have lost connectivity with five or six different participants Wi-Fi in the home is very, very challenging. It's very difficult to get Wi-Fi to connect to all devices, it's even when they're actually close, very close to them. You know, you'd be surprised um, the connectivity doesn't work. And then you get human behavior kind of uh, fitting into the mix there as well, where people unplug a router or turn off a router at nighttime or knock a router out of the wall with a couch when you're moving a couch and we lose all connectivity. So there's all of that sort of stuff. There's lots and lots of different challenges, but we've also seen kind of other issues as well, where some of the, the products that we've rolled out or the devices that we've rolled out in the property, those manufacturers of those products have their regular schedules of updates or software updates, and they roll them out globally. And there might be a change to firmware or software over the wire and should suddenly, you know, there we go, bang, we can't connect with something. The API suddenly doesn't work and we have to deal with all these issues. So when you're dealing with flexibility at residential customer level, where potentially you have, you might have thousands of customers. I know we've only 35 odd premises, but, you know, potentially uh, on a larger scale, the challenges of maintaining and being able to connect to all those customers is very, very challenging and uh, much more challenging than when you're just dealing with flexibility across large industrial customers where you might only have five or 10 customers that you're dealing with. So different, different ballpark that um, this is allowing us to understand. And I suppose the next few slides show some of the learnings and observations from our trials to date. So our EV trial kicked off at the start of February and we allocated 15 EVs to some of our trial participants. 10 of them were Hyundai Konas and five of them were Nissan Leafs. Now, since then, we've seen almost a continuous rise in distance driven each week until you know, around the holiday season where it may, might have tailed off a little bit. Now, some people that have the EVs are driving more than 2,000 kilometres a month and some are even doing more than 1,000 kilometres per week. And we've had people that have driven up to 670 odd kilometres a day um, utilizing the, the public and the fast charging network um, in parallel with their home charging or in addition to their home charging. Now, from our metering data, we have seen the impact of EV charging compared to previous years. And I'll look at this in a little bit more um, in a second. But really, it, kind of the key message from this is that, you know, electric vehicles do work um, in rural settings. Previously, there was lots of talk, you know, about an EV being most suitable to people that live near a large urban area and might have been just commuting 70 kilometers a day. But we're actually seeing that the EVs definitely do work in, in a rural community area. 
Confidence has definitely grown among the, the trial participants in electric boating. And I suppose uh, we do have to remember when we look at some of our, dis, uh, our data that the increasing distance that we've seen over some of the months might be a little bit skewed by the relaxing COVID-19 restrictions and the resumption of pre-pandemic activity. So, you know, we're not getting carried away with it and thinking that people are going to ever, ever increase their, their motoring on a weekly basis. But anyway, it's still interesting when you look at some of the data. And using the telematic information that we have for each of the EVs on our trial, we can compare the distance traveled against the energy used for home charging. Now, for the most part, there's a broad correlation across all the people on our trials, but there's a couple of outliers that we looked into. So for the two highlighted in red, they were charging more than one EV in their home. In fact, one of these people was so impressed with electric motoring in the first couple of months of the trial, they went out and actually bought another EV. So they were really impressed with the savings and just the whole experience. So they went out and they essentially changed their, their second car in the home for another EV. Um, so that's, that's, I suppose, a positive sign. Um, for the one highlighted in blue, this person actually went on holiday on the Wild Atlantic Way. So they were using the public charging infrastructure. So while their, their mileage was, was maybe as expected, their energy consumption in the home was less. Um, and that was the reason for it. Now, for the five recipients of the Nissan Leafs, just last week, we switched them out, uh, their EV chargers, and we gave them the V2G chargers. And Last night we did our first um, our first trial of a V2G export um, about seven o'clock yesterday, evening, and the technology worked. So we actually had it uh, thrown out power on, onto into the home essentially, and then most of that fed out onto the network for about twenty minutes just to prove that technology works and it does. So like overall, there's been a really positive um, feedback from the, the wider community on the EV trial. It's certainly the most noticeable thing. Um, in terms of what we're doing. And um, most of the other technology is hidden away in people's homes, but the EVs, 15 of them are 17 of them when you include the other two that people are floating around with. You know, it's a very obvious sign that something is changing. They're well branded and they're definitely a great uh, source of conversation across the community as a whole. So like people are seeing it and they're switching on to what, what the whole program is about. And I suppose if you look at our solar PV participants and uh, the project, um, we're seeing that you know, over the last 18 months or so, the level of spill has reduced. Now, this might be explained as well in, in part uh, to, due to people being at home during the lockdown. So energy usage during the day is increasing. But we also know some people are trying to maximize their solar production uh, by turning on load at the, uh, in, the, in the home uh, to, to align with when the, sol when the sun is shining. But a few of them have also installed solar diverters, uh, essentially to trickle feed any excess power to heat hot water. Now, this doesn't guarantee that you're going to eliminate all your spill from your solar PV, um, as perhaps maybe your water tank is up, will have already reached uh, the required temperature or your hot water needs in the home might be quite low in certain times. But I suppose the graph here um, shows level of spill for one of our solar PV trial participants. Now, the dark blue is the 2020 spill and the brown or orange core color we've overlaid it with the 2021 spill so you can see the difference so we snapped this date about september time frame so you can see up to about april there was kind of general alignment to spill across the two years um this person installed a solar diverter about week 20 on the graph there and you can see a significant reduction in spill since then um i suppose the increase in spill around week 26 might relate to uh, reduced hot water in the home. Uh, perhaps people were away on holidays or maybe it was a very sunny week. We didn't really dig into it too deeply. Similarly for weeks uh, 30 and 33, it could have been a similar scenario there. Now, I mentioned earlier on that we've installed low voltage monitors at 30 locations across the peninsula uh, to help us understand the impact on the LV network of various technologies. One of the, one of the areas where we installed um, a monitoring device wasn't for one of our trial participants um, or for a number of them, but there's, a, there's an area in Dingle Town where there's 20 houses and they've all been equipped with heat pumps. Um, and we actually installed a, a monitor there at, at the substation that's feeding them just to understand what the impact of that might be. And I suppose what we noticed was a large spike in energy usage at the same time every Saturday night, Sunday morning. And when we investigated this, it's associated with all heat pumps doing their, their weekly legionnaires clean and cycle at the same time probably because they were the default settings on the devices when they were installed. So 20 of them rolled out with exactly the same settings. So the Legionnaire cycle kicks off in every property at exactly the same time. And I suppose that kind of, that's a bit of a challenge to us. Um, and I suppose we have to figure out how we can work with the contractors and developers to make sure that they spread these things out so that maybe they're spread out different hours 
over that day or different days of the week. And it's really to minimize the peaks um, that we're actually seeing or, or the kind of the load from this. And I suppose uh, today when we were out showing people uh, some of the stuff at one of our ambassador properties, kind of the same thing came to mind. You could have a similar scenario arising um, with electric vehicle charging, where say, for example, a number of, say you have five or six people connected to a single transformer and a number of them, three or four of them decide to buy an EV. Um, and if their suppliers were to have a tariff that drove um, the charging to, uh, to say, a, period, a particular period in the day, say night time between one o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning, if they're all charging at that same time, you could see the transformer becoming stressed a bit like this, but of course, for a much longer and a much bigger load. Um, and that could cause us problems. So like what we're trying to do in our flexibility trials as well is see, can we balance out some of this EV charging um, on parts of the network where there are a number of different EVs connected, just to see, can we actually spread that out and minimize the impacts? And I suppose the last few slides that I have in the presentation, you'd be glad to hear. Um, what I want to do is kind of show you some of the observations in relation to the kind of the changing energy footprint that we've observed uh, for our Dingle ambassadors over, the, over the, the trial period to date. So first of all, just looking at four of our five ambassadors um, over the period 2019, through to 2021. 20, so if you look at the top plot there, you can see the impact of EV charging um, on a week to week basis. So, you know, obviously the load has gone up. So very simple. On the bottom plot, you can see the big reduction in solar PV uh, spill onto the grid uh, from the time the batteries were installed. So we installed batteries around kind of May, the end of May, start of June this year. And you can see that spill kind of tailed off because the battery is integrated with the solar panel. Um, I suppose if we, if we start focusing now on just one ambassador in particular. Um, so I suppose, first of all, if you look at 2019, around the same time as we installed our quarter hour meter. So we've really rich data since then. So you can clearly see that there was lots of energy being spilled. Um, and we weren't in a position where we could feed back a huge amount of information to the, to the ambassadors at that point in time. So they were probably unaware of the level of spill that was going on and not being in a position to take um, any corrective measures for it. I suppose if you look at the top graph there around November 2019, um, we installed the air source heat pump for this ambassador. So you can really see how the energy uh, usage increased at that point or from that point on. So then if we look at overlaying the 2020 date on top of this, um, so first of all, you can see the, the impact of electrified heating in the top graph across the whole year. So if you look at week 16 to 40, which is about the May to October timeframe, um, so you can see kind of the increase in demand above 2020 in particular. And uh, like what we're thinking is that most of this is probably to do water heating because space heating needs will be a lot less um, than in the other, the other periods of the year. Um, because you can see it really ramping up then again from October onwards as, as they needed to heat the home. Um, in the bottom graph, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the spilled energy in 2020 throughout the summer was less than 2019, could be down to um, COVID-19 and people working at home and using more energy, maybe just the increased awareness uh, of energy usage and people trying to align their consumption with local generation. But it's just interesting when you look at the evolution of these uh, profiles. I suppose then if you try to overlay the 2021 data to date that we have on top of that, the big change on the top end is uh, the top graph is to do with the EV charge. And so the, EV char or the EVs were handed out in February. I can really see a step change in electricity consumption from then. Um, I suppose in this one, it's probably equating to 250 to 500 kilometers driven weekly. That's kind of what we're assuming for this ambassador. Um, if you look at the lower graph, the installation of the residential batteries around June of this year and link them to the solar PV has seen a dramatic uh, reduction in spill uh, since then. And I suppose looking across both graphs there, the, the areas in green that are highlighted there, this relates to a time when that ambassador and the family went on a holiday. Um, so first of all, the EV charging load was removed in the top area and you can see the spill increasing in the bottom. And we expect that by the end of the year that we have an even more complete picture of the evolution of the energy profile. Um, again, we were chatting about this today and we are saying, isn't it a good thing that we actually phase the rollout of these technologies because you get to see how the profile changes over time rather than just doing the big bang and putting everything in together when a lot of this kind of, the, a lot of this impact will be masked by the impact of other technologies. So, you know, hopefully people find some of this interesting. I do. You know, so that's, I'm coming to the end of my presentation now. Um, 
And I suppose our project is drawn to a conclusion at the end of this year. Our technology trials will finish in January um, of next year. But what we're hoping to do in, and we will be doing in early December, is holding um, a conference or a lunchtime webinar series um, which, where we'll share the learnings and the insights to date across a number of different uh, kind of topic areas. So you'll have people from our, our project uh, speaking, coupled with uh, some of the trial participants and some industry experts. So hopefully maybe if you're interested in seeing a little bit more or hearing a little bit more about the project, some of you will join in and uh, we'll certainly share with uh, Engineers Ireland the invite to that and it could be passed on to all our members. So look, that's it. Um, I'm happy now to, I'll just stop sharing and happy now for Q&A. So. Thank you, Fergal. That was very interesting. I have to say you covered a lot there. Um, there's a few questions um, coming in, so I hope you're happy enough to answer them. So there's kind of two questions that are kind of along the same line from Declan and Brian. Um, how did you choose the project persist, uh, participants and did they all stay with the project? Yeah, so um, we did a number of different things. So initially, we needed to get our five ambassadors uh, to work with us. So we saw the expressions of interest from people across the peninsula. And, you know, in truth, looking back now, there wasn't tremendous interest. People were a little bit unsure about what the whole thing was about. Uh, some people probably saw that, you know, they're going to get technology and they expressed an interest. But what we actually wanted people to do was really tell their story, why they wanted to be a participant with us. It wasn't just so that we could learn the impact on the, the load profile, for example, but we wanted people who would really work and engage and communicate their story across the peninsula. So they had to, they had to essentially express it, their interest in it. And we picked the people that we thought would best work with us. So that was for our five ambassadors as such. And um, again, we had lots of people that were interested in the solar PV and getting solar panels on the roof. It's not hard to get people interested when you're giving away free stuff. And um, so that's kind of good. But, you know, where we really were impressed um, was the level of interest in, in the EV trial. So while we had might have had, I think it was 60 or something people initially were interested in becoming ambassadors, we had nearly 500 people wanted an EV for a year. So the, the interest is really phenomenal in it. Um, so the, that was it was fairly simple, you know, um, and most of them have stuck with us. As I said, unfortunately, we haven't been able to utilize the, the solar PV participants as much as we wanted. We had hoped that they'd be the backbone of our peer-to-peer -peer trial, which unfortunately had to get canceled. So they're kind of a little bit more passive, those guys, and we're hoping that the information that we provide them now through the mobile app will bring some more of them into the fold. But unfortunately now, we're at the time of the year where solar is kind of tailing off. Um, so our project is finishing end of December, end of January sort of time frame. So maybe some of those people, we won't have got the kind of the, the value from those trial participants as we had hoped. Yeah, and just to follow on for that, uh, maybe covered within the talk, uh, but can people on the Dink Peninsula still join the scheme or is there gonna be a follow-up scheme? Yeah, that's interesting. So our project finishes at the end of this year or the end of January next year, but we're looking to see whether there might be some follow-on initiatives. So um, the Dingle Innovation and Creativity Hub, they're one of the partners on the Cork Green or Dingle 2030 initiative, and they're looking at lots and lots of other opportunities into the future. But Kerry County Council has also uh, chosen the Dingle Peninsula as its decarbonisation zone. So there might be further opportunities to do a follow-on. Like, like certainly we're not dismantling the test bed we're turning off a few bits and pieces because we have to but all the kit will still remain on people's homes and um, the ev lease comes to an end at the end of january so we have to give the cars back maybe people will choose to uh, talk to the dealership adams in tralee there and maybe try to get a good deal on an ev or you wouldn't know but you know a lot of the infrastructure is going to remain there there's great potential for doing further trials and um, you know we're actually we, we have a meeting uh in September with, with a good number of people across the research performing organizations in the country. And we're, we're hoping to educate them on what we've done in the trials. And maybe there's an opportunity for further initiatives in collaboration with some of the, the people and organizations that are on the peninsula. Yeah, and just um, two questions there from Ray. Um, if electric vehicles hit the target suggested by the government in 2030, is there a danger of locally overloading uh, LV networks? So the pole tra transformers for six houses that all have EV charging, they all have EV charge at the same time. So I think you kind of covered that. 
Yeah, and, and there's another there's another program going on across uh, ESB networks where they're looking at this whole issue, uh, trying to identify those transformers on our networks that are, that are at greatest risk um, to overloading and figuring out how they can actually upgrade those transformers. And I suppose there's lots of challenges about how you upgrade transformers, particularly if you're thinking of rural, our urban areas where, you know, you have a substation, you can't you can't find land to put another one in. So we're working with some partners to actually develop new, new transformers that can fit into the existing substations that be higher capacity and things like that to deal with this real challenge that's coming our way of the networks um, having to essentially serve a greater load um, throughout the day. So yeah, big, big challenges ahead for ESB networks, but certainly things that we're, we're really keen to get a grip on and move on. Yeah, and will you restart the peer-to-peer at uh, LV at some point in the future? I, uh, we we don't know to tell you the truth. Um, like we were we were doing something peer to peer because we were putting all this technology in anyway. And um, it might be better for ESB networks to just understand the learnings of other peer to peer trials. And um, so if suppliers, for example, some supplier organization wanted to try peer to peer, and um, we might collaborate with them or install some monitors to understand what the impact on our network is. That might be a more effective way of us getting our learnings rather than trying to kickstart something ourselves. Thanks for that. Um, another question if you're uh, a very interesting presentation. Have you found specific profiles specifically around uh, current peak times that could be used to help alleviate the current pressures on the network due to generation shortages, either via direct control or via education? Um, we, we probably haven't as yet. We haven't done enough analysis of the data that we've um, that we've started to collect. Um, I showed the heat pump situation there for the the, the cluster in, in Dingletown, but we haven't done enough yet. Um, and certainly our flexibility tests, which were, we only started kicking off there last week, they'd be trying to show us the potential that you can actually alleviate some of these you know, conditions um, on the network. So like, it's just a little bit too early for us to say what we've seen um, there and whether you can connect other generation locally or whatever based on our flexibility tests. But ultimately that's what we're hoping to prove uh, by the end of it, that we'll have enough information to at least have something positive to say, you know. Um, did you have any uh, any work association with the EU funding for future installations in Kerry, perhaps linking up with uh, SEAI local community projects? So no, we no, we didn't. No, we, we didn't do any of that. Um, but there are lots of other initiatives happening uh, down on the peninsula. For example, there's um, we worked with with Kerry College to to kickstart an energy mentor program. There's also been done. There's been energy assessments, or I don't know what you call them, energy clinics um, carried out where a number of assessments of different property types on the peninsula uh, to try and figure out, is there a way of classifying properties into different types um, so that people would have a better understanding if they were going to go down, say, the deep retrofit route, you know, in general for a property of this style, this is what's involved and these are kind of ballpark costs. So there's lots of good stuff going on in that whole space. Maybe I haven't answered the right question there, but Anyway. Yeah, I'm just for myself. Um, is this information going to be available to the public, like to researchers and things like that? Because it's you know, it's fascinating. Yeah. So, like, ultimately, the learnings from our project, we want to share them with all interested stakeholders. Maybe some of them will be appropriate for um, to help inform future policy in at a national level. And uh, maybe it'll all be locally of local interest, but it's going to be made available. The data from um, our trials as well, we're going to make that available in an anonymized format um, so that people um, can, can use it for further research uh, projects over time. So yeah, like hopefully, hopefully the learnings will be maximized by lots of interesting stakeholders. And another question, this was not a three or four. Um, we um, EV export the grid. I know it's a bit early. Outcome in line. With, is your outcome in line with expectations, or were there any surprises? So, um, I I, yeah, like we, we just did our first test last night to see could we we dump power onto the network. So yeah, it works. Um, we don't know how sustainable it is. Certainly, one thing I can say is that the e, the smart or what do we call the V2G chargers, and um, the ones that we're using are certainly in the range of eight to ten times the, the cost of a standard. Um, EV charger. So, you know, the price of it is is a 
is a lot higher for the technology. Um, obviously, the price point will start to fall down when they become commercially available. Um, but I suppose if you look at the size of, a, of a, an EV battery, certainly the, the, the volume of energy being stored in it um, is a lot bigger, say, than the, the energy that would be stored in, in the, the batteries in a residential property. So you could have maybe 64 kilowatt hours or so in a, in a car battery and where you might only have five or 10 in the, in the residential property. So depending on your lifestyle and how you use your EV, your 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 EV, if it's compatible for VTG purposes, and the leafs that we have in our trial are, maybe um, V2G might work for you um, to allow your the energy be taken out of your battery at certain times. For some people, it might work. For some, it mightn't. But there's a lot more kind of uh, trialing and testing and that sort of stuff to figure out what's the best way to that it might work at a at a commercial level, um, or, the, or what the what the sweet spot might be for that. Yeah, and just a couple more. Questions. Are there plans to increase the maximum import capacity for domestic customers? Um, there was some work done um, recently by some of my colleagues in in ESP Networks, um, and what we call the after after diversity maximum demand, the ADMD, certainly has been increased. Um, I think it might have been two point five, and it's gone up to five point five now for for new builds. Um, so that's to reflect kind of the expectation that that load is going to increase in, in properties over time. So that's a new design standard that's um, that's been implemented now and, and new new uh, housing estates, for example, will be designed on that basis. Hopefully I have those numbers right, but certainly certainly the MIC is is essentially being increased. And um, just for a weird time, is there any issues with the domestic premises exceeding the max load and blowing the main fumes? Um, <laughs> Ah, <laughs> you're getting me with this one. Yeah, what? So um, we we've had the odd instance where somebody has an EV charger installed, um, and then they decide to turn on their uh, electric shower, um, and the MCB uh, blows, which is what it's supposed to do. Whereas we know that if they had their electric shower on first, and then they went to plug in their EV, the EV load would be tempered so that. That, that situation didn't happen. So like, it's really a case of the speed of response um, of the controllers to eight point whatever kilowatts of uh, electric shower going on versus kind of the, the more gradual take up of an EV charger. Um, it's really, which one, that, which one went first? Is it the chicken or the egg sort of thing here? You know, um, if, if, you, if you turn on your electric shower after you've kickstarted your EV charging, you could have a problem. But if you do it the other way around, it's probably okay. So a little bit of understanding in the home about what you should and shouldn't do could alleviate that problem. Uh, one from Martin there. In the price-driven algorithm, uh, can users override the default setting? Like I need my EV at 8 p.m., not tomorrow morning. Yeah, um, I, I suppose part, part of what we were trying to do today, um, we went out to one of the trial participants' homes and we were demonstrating how all this stuff works. So the algorithm was working and the heat pump was on at the time we were there. And we wanted to actually override that and turn the heat pump off to just to demonstrate some of our bubbles on one of our charts there. Um, and the, the technology was fighting against us. So we were turning off the heat pump and the, the green comm algorithm was turning it back on. So you were seeing a bit of a real struggle there. Um, can you charge your, your EV at a time that suits you? Um, we're looking to see whether for some of the people, if the solar, if the solar was still spilling, um, that you might be able to maximize it and move some of it into the EV battery. Um, it's not something that we're actually doing at the moment, but potentially you could do that. So there's lots of ways you can configure the algorithm to do what you want to do. At the moment, we're trying to do it to provide the best economic outcome for all the people on our trials. Yeah, and just final two questions. So, mm -hmm. and um, I see Octopus Energy mentioned in the presentation. Uh, they have rewards for an active energy user. Is there any plans for the ESB to introduce a similar uh, scheme? Um, certainly no plans at the moment that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, even in terms of our trial, we'd love to do more. If we had a longer time period, if we had another year in our, in our project trial, there's lots that we could do about trying to drive behaviour change um, and trying to recognise that and but like I suppose what we're trying to do at the moment is get the ambassadors to tell their story. So they're active energy citizens as we would see it, um, both in terms of their behaviours and how they're understanding their energy consumption and their local production and maximising that for their own value, but also they're active in terms of telling their story, trying to not so much uh, gloss over some of the, the challenges because there's always challenges in this space, but they're telling it warts and all so that others can go into the, that whole process with their eyes wide open.
So. And finally, on the vehicle to, vehicle to grid chargers, um, would they leave the users with a specific amount of charge when remotely dispatched? Uh, that is like only discharged to 50% when demanded. Yeah, that, that'd be the intention that you'd always run it so that it always uh, leaves a certain state of charge of the battery. So the last thing you want to do is to whip all the power out. Somebody goes out to use the car and yeah, it can only go five kilometers in it. So yeah, now you have to be mindful of that. Um, the whole time when you're discharging power, both from the residential batteries and from um, the VTGs. And a lot of the technology is actually configured so that once it gets below a certain level, it goes into charge mode again. Certainly the residential batteries generally operate on that level once they get down to X percentage of uh, how full they are, they start kind of ramping up again. That's great. Thanks very much for your answers. No uh, so finally, um, I would like just to introduce Orla Burke, the chair, of the electrical division to just say a few words. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, I have the delightful job of giving the vote of thanks this evening. So I guess, first of all, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. We had great interest in this evening's presentation. So I'm delighted that you all could join us this evening. Um, I'd also like to thank, obviously, the, the Cork region and on React, particular Val, Michael and Jerry for co-hosting. And hopefully it's the first of many co-hosted events this year. Um, and just to remind people about the, the Cork Region events to celebrate their 80 years um, and also other events coming up, just check out the Engineers Ireland website. So I guess the, the main vote of thanks this evening goes to Fergal. I think it's very evident from the, the comments in the chat and from the questions, there was high level of interest and it was such a thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable um, and engaging presentation. And I think very timely, we've all obviously seen on the news um, it's quite topical of climate change and how we will balance this, this demand supply going forward. Um, and I loved hearing about how we'll hopefully all become low carbon active energy citizens going forward. Um, it's also very interesting, I guess, to see how much data analytics is going to play um, going forward. Um, so really look forward to hearing the final results of the study. And to, just to remind you all, uh, as Fergal mentioned, the upcoming webinar is in December, where we'll hopefully get to hear a lot more about the project. So Fergal, thank you for joining us from the lovely Dingle Peninsula, and we wish you and the team the very best of luck in the remainder of the project. Thank you. Thanks very much.